Bank of America is one of America's largest banks and has been for some time. It's been around for many decades and has gone through a roller coaster of ups and downs as the economic tides of the country have changed along with it. So what's behind this bank and what makes it so powerful and interesting today? And should we even look at the stock? We're going to discover all these things today here on Stock Stories. All right, all right. Welcome, welcome to Stock Stories. My name is Alex Mason, and I'm your host and stock storyteller. This is the show where we decode the business behind the stock. We've studied over 150 stocks so far with over 250 episodes, and we are rolling. So let's go ahead and continue our series on the largest banks in America by looking at Bank of America. <laughs> First, let's look at the history. The history of Bank of America dates back all the way to 1904, when Amadeo Peter Giannini founded the Bank of Italy in San Francisco, California. Giannini was a visionary banker who believed that everyone should have access to banking services, regardless of their social class. He opened the Bank of Italy in a working class neighborhood, and what he would do is make loans to people who had been turned down by other banks and often just seal the deal with a handshake. Now, over the years, he built up his reputation as a good lender. And then in 1928, the company merged with another bank in Los Angeles, and it was renamed Bank of America. Now, at the time of the merger, the business had over 450 branches in the state of California, but Giannini's ambitions were to build a truly national bank, as well as an integrated business that expanded into insurance. Now, unfortunately, at the time, banks were not allowed to operate in multiple states, and this happened by law. And so Giannini's holding company, Transamerica Corporation, which sold insurance products, was separated by regulators in 1953. But these regulations didn't stop the business from finding innovative ways to expand and grow their profits. Inspired by the Diners Club charge card, Bank of America invented the Bank AmeriCard in 1958. And by the 1970s, its name was changed to Visa. Now, this was a huge invention because it allowed consumers to spend money now and pay for goods and services later. The card was linked to individual bank accounts, and this gave Bank of America enormous leverage because people could now spend money through their bank, but also do it through this card. Now, throughout the 1970s and 1980s, Bank of America expanded both organically and through acquisitions of other banks. For example, the C First Corporation in Seattle, Washington. Now, though Bank of America itself couldn't expand into other states directly, it could buy up competitors that weren't operating in California. Fast forward to the 1990s. In 1994, there was the passage of something called the Regal Neal Interstate Banking and Branching Efficiency Act. Say that five times fast. <laughs> now, this passage of law is what finally allowed Bank of America, as well as other banks, to finally expand their footprint beyond the state in which they were originally chartered. In 1998, Bank of America started suffering some major losses, unfortunately, because one of its subsidiaries was losing money from Russian bonds. Competitor Nations Bank, which was based in Charlotte, North Carolina, ended up acquiring Bank of America and keeping the Bank of America name. Now, at this point, the bank had expanded substantially, and by the turn of the millennium, the combined business had over 4,800 branches in 22 states. Then, throughout the next decade, things were going all right for Bank of America, and it started to recover. But then, at the beginning of 2008, tragedy struck again. Bank of America purchased home mortgage company Countrywide Financial for $4.1 billion. Now, this seemed like a good idea at the time because it allowed Bank of America to control at least 20% of the home mortgage market, which was a pretty profitable market. Now, even though executives liked this acquisition, it was fraught with problems as Countrywide had a history of engaging in discriminatory lending practices to Black and Latino borrowers not to mention making bad loans during the early to mid-2000s. Now, in hindsight, Countrywide Financial's activities were a major contributor to the subprime mortgage crisis that followed. But because Bank of America now owned this company, they had to bear the burden of the losses and fines associated with the fallout. Since the acquisition, Bank of America has paid over $23 billion in fines. This includes a $16 billion fine, the largest civil settlement in American history. Ouch. Now, the stock price fell significantly, and it took many years to recover. 
as Bank of America cleaned up the mess left over from the financial crisis. Now, around this time, Bank of America also acquired Merrill Lynch, an investment management and banking business that was on the verge of collapse. So it was forced to acquire that business by federal regulators, but in return, it was given over $45 billion in bailout money. So from the time of the financial crisis to about 2014, the bank downsized and cut thousands of jobs as it dealt with falling revenue and litigation costs related to its beleaguered assets. But in 2015, the bank returned to growth, and over the next several years, it began opening up new branches in other cities, for example, in Denver, Pittsburgh, and Cincinnati. Now, Bank of America has risen again to the second largest bank by deposits in the country with $1.7 trillion in deposits. It is second only to J.P. Morgan Chase with $2 trillion. So Bank of America has definitely recovered and is now currently thriving. Let's now turn our attention to the business model of this company in the present day. Bank of America technically has eight lines of business, but that just seems like a lot to me. We can really consolidate this into a couple specific business areas. First of all, there's the consumer banking segment, which houses retail banking and preferred banking. Essentially, this is what you and I as regular consumers would do as far as our interactions with the bank, opening things like checking accounts, savings accounts, that kind of thing. Then you have global wealth and investment management. This is where the Merrill business comes in, working with high net worth individuals, as well as the private bank for, bank for estate planning. Basically, this is where wealthy people go to have their money managed and advised by Bank of America. Then you have the global banking segment. This is where you have things like corporate and investment banking, as well as business banking. So helping businesses buy and sell each other, perform different types of capital transactions. That's this segment of the business. And then there's global market. Fundamentally, Bank of America has a business model that's very similar to other large financial institutions. It takes in money for deposits, pays out a certain amount of interest on that cash, and then lends out money to both individuals and businesses at a higher rate. That's fundamentally what Bank of America does. And it also has these other lines of business like the wealth management, where it manages money on behalf of clients and takes a cut of the assets under management as its fee, and then also has investment banking activities where they collect fees for helping businesses merge, uh, acquire other businesses, and raise capital. So that's how Bank of America makes money. It's very similar to other large banks that we study like a Goldman Sachs or a JP Morgan Chase, but probably a little bit more similar to a JP Morgan Chase. Let's take a peek at the financials of Bank of America. Right now, I'm looking at the first quarterly report of 2023 for Bank of America. And one thing that we can see is the average loan and lease trends. Remember, banks primarily make money off of the loans that they have. So we want to generally see loan growth because that's going to increase the interest income that that bank is going to generate. So total loans and leases in terms of billions of dollars at the beginning of 2022, they had about $978 billion in loans and leases. Fast forward a year later to first quarter 2023, just over a trillion dollars in loans and leases. That's a 7% year over year increase. So yeah, decent growth here. It's nothing super, super exciting as far as a fast growing business. But hey, this is what you would want to see for a business as large as Bank of America is. You would want to see this kind of growth. And then that's broken down here in terms of the different business segments. What I'm really loving here is that between the different segments of Bank of America, between consumer banking, global banking, et cetera, we can see mid -dig single digit growth across all these segments, which means that the business is very diversified. There's no one segment here that's taking up all of the action here in terms of the financial assets and therefore the revenue of Bank of America. So I like to see that it's a pretty diversified financial business and seems like a pretty strong bank. Getting a little bit more into the nitty gritty here, I'm looking at the latest 10K filing for Bank of America, the selected annual financial data in table six. And this is just showing some basic facts for, from the income statement of the company. And what I'm seeing here is a gradual growth in interest income because, hey, interest rates have gone up, so it should positively affect the bank there. And then non-interest income, 
which has actually gone down a little bit from 46 billion in 2021 to 42 billion in 2022. And you know what? I expect this because things like merger and acquisition activity was way, 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 way down compared to 2021. 2021 was like this huge banner year across all of the financial businesses. I won't say all the financial businesses, but a lot of financial businesses really benefited because valuations were just so high in 2021. So I'm not that surprised, but overall revenue, look, we're seeing good increases. 85 billion in 2020, 89 billion in 2021, and 94.9 billion in 2022. So this business is still growing. And I also like to see this is the average diluted common shares outstanding has been going down. They went from just under 8.8 .8 billion shares outstanding in 2020 to now just over 8.1 billion in 2022. And management has stated that they're actively buying back shares. And Bank of America also pays out a nice dividend as well. We can see their dividend payout. 26.77 in 2022. Um, and so, you know, on a per share basis, let's see, that's 86 cents per share relative to 72 cents per share a couple of years ago. So dividends are increasing, buyouts are increasing, and revenue is increasing. These are all good things. I'm seeing great things from Bank of America. It's not a super fast growing business, but I like this. Now, looking at the balance sheet, we can see that long-term debt, I mean, it's been creeping up there, $246 billion. I mean, that seems like a massive amount, right? <laughs> but if you look at the amount of assets this company has, it's literally got trillions of dollars in assets. So that amount of debt doesn't really bother me, especially since debt is a huge part of how banks as a business actually operate. So those are some things that I would say on the financial side. As far as the stock goes, Bank of America stock, ticker symbol BAC, is down over 14% over the past year, and over the past five years is been basically flat. So what does this mean? This means that I think there's actually an opportunity here for potential investors, because look at this PE ratio. It's 8.3, pretty low. And I know also from looking at the price to book ratio, the price to book ratio is under one, which means that it's trading for less than the technical net worth of the business based on its balance sheet. So I think Bank of America is trading at a decent value here with that 3% dividend yield, add to that the growth of the dividend, add to that a decent amount of share buybacks, taking down the share count a few percentage points per year. You really only need organic revenue growth somewhere in the five to 6% range to get double digit returns. So I think Bank of America is trading pretty fairly here. Um, maybe not incredibly cheap, but definitely not expensive. I would say this is on the lower end of fair value. Uh, from my estimation based on what I've seen. So that's what I got for you today. This is Alex Mason with Stock Stories, and I'll see you on the next one.